We are in Jonah chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 4 through 16 this morning. And we'll begin by looking at verses 4 and 5. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, for he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Let's pray. Father, the contrast here could not be greater. We see sailors so afraid that they're trying to do anything to save their lives, while Jonah, ignoring their fear, is asleep. Open our eyes, help us to see, and help us to know what you want us to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, <laughs> I've been at sea during the storm. Uh, I was on a destroyer escort going from San Long Beach to San Francisco and off the Farallon Islands and the Channel Islands. There was a storm that was so bad that even the chiefs were sick. Uh, that's a bad storm. Uh, and yet I never for a moment feared that my ship was going to founder. Of course, I was in a 300-foot uh, steel ship instead of a 40-foot wooden dinghy. <laughs> But Jonah, remember last well, two weeks ago we looked at uh, how God had told him to preach to the Ninevites that uh, judgment was coming, and Jonah, fearing that God was really giving the Ninevites a chance to repent, decided to go the opposite direction, so he got on a ship headed for Tarshish so that he could go and not do what God called him to do. When Saul the Pharisee was confronted by the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road, Jesus told him that he was acting like a stubborn animal. He says it's not it's hard to kick against the goads. Now, if you were not raised in an agricultural context, you might not get what that means. In Saul's day, a goad was a sharp stick, and you used it to get animals moving. Uh, in my day, when I worked for Tyson Company in Arkansas, I spent a lot of time loading hogs onto trucks. Hogs don't like to go on trucks. And so we had goads. They were electric cattle prods. And you hit the button and it sends a short zap and it encourages the hogs to go. Some hogs don't care. I've seen a hog stand there when somebody put the cattle prod next to their eye and hit the button. And they would stand there and squeal and not budge. That's like Saul. <laughs> it's hard to kick against the goads, but they do it anyway. Jonah is another in that stubborn category. As are the sailors on that boat. They obstinately refuse to fear God, and as a result, they end up fearing their circumstance. And that's what you have here. They're in a storm and they're doing what they know how to do. Save the boat. And it's so bad that they're throwing the cargo overboard. Now you need to understand this. That's not their cargo. That's somebody else's cargo that they're responsible for. Uh, if they show up without the money for the cargo or without the cargo to get the money, they could lose their ship. They could be put in jail, in debtor's prison. They could, all kinds of things could happen to them. And so it's telling you that the situation is that bad that they don't care. It's more important to them to save their lives. So the sailors are afraid of the storm. Uh, they don't fear the Lord, the God of all the earth. And so when this great, big, giant, uncontrollable circumstance arises in their life, that is the number one thing. Now this is Obviously, it's literal for the sailors, but it's metaphorical for you and I. Because every day, there's always some circumstance. There's always something saying, hey, I'm so important, deal with me right now. It's this bill, or it's this person at work, or it's this test coming up, 
or it's this thing, or it's, oh no, the washing machine belt gave out. Oh, it's always something. There's some circumstance saying, I am the most important thing in the entire world. Deal with me right now. And so the sailors are doing all they can to deal with this circumstance, and it's not working. Now, it's not like Jonah running around back and forth on deck going, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? These are professionals. They know what to do. And they're doing everything they can, and it's not helping. Meanwhile, Jonah, who in theory feared the Lord, is escaping what God wants him to do. He's running away. He knows better. Gee, that never happened in my life. Yeah. The burden of running away from God's will was greater than the circumstance of the storm that the boat is in. He's afraid of God. He's not fearing God. He's afraid of God right now. But he's not afraid of the storm. Matter of fact, as far as Jonah's concerned, if the ship sinks, swell. There's no way I can go to Nineveh. And so there he is, snoring away below decks. And as a prophet, don't you think he should have been concerned about the sailors? They're in danger because of him. Because he knows that the storm is from God. And he slept while they fretted. And that brings me back to me. Am I sleeping in my comfort while the world dashes around in terror? To some extent, yes. The whole world is running around. Oh no, where's the fire? Oh no, the circumstances. Oh no. And I'm, hey, I'm saved. I got my fire insurance. I don't care. I put it that way on purpose because I, I want to see the, the harshness of it. Do I really not care? Well, you know, if I get to talk to an individual person, then, then you know, I'll talk to them and stuff like that. But i got to tell you, metaphorically, I don't run into building, burning buildings to drag people out. And really, that's kind of our job. We're supposed to be God's witnesses and representatives on the earth. If I drove down the street and I saw a house on fire and no fire trucks there, and I went... Oh, oh, I got my cell phone. Eh, no, my minutes are low, so I'm not calling 911. <laughs> That's just wrong. <laughs> and yet, I have to ask myself, what is my attitude? i got to tell you, I, I don't mean to be harsh. I'm talking mostly to me, but I don't see our church as having much concern for that. You know, we're here. They want to get saved. They can come to church. Hey, I'm, I just want you to know I'm beating on myself right now. What are we doing? Verse 6. The captain went to him, Jonah, and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us so that we won't perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who's responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Notice how he phrased that. Now Jonah, the sailors are fearing their circumstances. Jonah fears the Lord. He really does. And the thing is, many times in our lives, we can say, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I believe that he died on the cross, rose from the den, dead, paid for my sin, and yet the way we live our lives sometimes, you might wonder, do I really believe that?
It's one thing to say, I fear the Lord. How can Jonah say, I fear the Lord, but I'm not doing what he wants me to do? And yet, I find in my own life too many times that I play that game with God. I love you, Lord, but I'm not going to do what you want. Uh, that's bad. And maybe, maybe if nothing else out of this whole book of Jonah, we could just get stop for a moment and God, I want to be honest with you about what I am and who I am. Maybe we can just get that out. So the gods of the sailors had to be sought and placated. Please, please take away the storm. Please have mercy on us. Please give us grace and take the storm away. They had to beg and plead with their gods for help. Jonah's God didn't wait to be asked. He's right there involved in Jonah's life like a loving dad. Jonah the captain is, get up, beg your God, maybe he'll, out of all the other gods that aren't doing anything, maybe he'll do something. He's already doing something. Jonah's God acted even after he'd been rejected. Well, of course he acted. He's punishing Jonah. Mm, be careful. Because that this is one of the lessons of the book. Is this punishment? Punishment would be, pull the plug, go, 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 there you go. Punishment would be, and you're not getting out of that whale either. Except, you know, the bad way. <laughs> God does not need your sacrifice, request, or approval to act. He acts according to his own will. He works regardless of our will. He is acting now and not in a, I'm so mad that Jonah's not doing what I want. I'll show him. That's not what he's doing. What Jonah is perceiving as God being mean to me is, in fact, God's redemptive love working to bring Jonah back to his will. And it's the same thing in your life. Too many times we experience something and we go, God's getting even with me. God's mad at me. God's poking me because of something I did. And he's, you know, spanking me right now. And maybe, perhaps, it's more like Jonah where God is moving to call us back to him. Redemptively moving in our life to turn us around to the right path. I'm not going to use any names. I'll be fictitious. If I had a son, <laughs> that was driving his car toward a cliff, and I went and, and reached over and smacked him and said, Stop that! That would be a redemptive act. <laughs> Since I don't have a son, <laughs> Uh, yes, but digitally <laughs> We sometimes experience what God is doing and think it's only anger, it's only wrath. And in fact, I believe that almost every time God's what we think of as God's wrath is actually God moving to turn us to something good and not to punish us. God's punishment isn't just vindictive. It's about redeeming us. It's about saving us. He disciplines in the hope that the wayward will repent and turn to him. The Hebrew word for repent is shuvi, and it literally means return. In the New Testament, the word repent means to turn around. In the Old Testament, the word means come back. Come back to me. Hebrews 12, 5-8 says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines 
the one he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardships as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate. Not true sons and daughters at all. God disciplines because he loves us. Because he wants us to become what he created us to be in the first place. So the sailors are fearing the storm. The, the Jonah, the prophet, is fearing God. Look at verse 10. we got a change coming up here. This terrified them. I What terrified them? Look at verse 9 again. He answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made sea and dry land. Verse 10. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? Now they know what he did because the second part of that verse says they knew he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. He didn't tell them that when he got on the ship and paid for his passage. He told them that just now. That's part of verse 9. He explained to them, I'm running away from God. I'm a prophet of God whom I'm running away from. And they said, what have you done? They're not asking for information. They're saying, you're a moron. Are you crazy? Verse 11, the sea was getting rougher and rougher. I love that phrase. Just in the middle of all this, this is happening, this is happening, this is that, why are you doing this? Get up, do this. The sea is getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you please. So the sailors have gone from fearing the storm to fearing Jonah. <laughs> they stopped fearing what was going on and they start fearing the person who brought it about. Jonah, what's going on? Why are you doing this? No, Jonah says, hey, no problem, guys. Just throw me overboard. But I love that they ask, what should we do to you? <laughs> now, throw me overboard sounds very noble. But remember, Jonah knew that if he died, he doesn't have to go to Nineveh. So again, it's, it's another way out for him. But they're thinking, if Jonah is so important to this God, what might he do to us? If we harm Jonah. And so, <laughs> row, row, row your boat. They get back to it. They do everything they can. They exhaust all of their skills, all of their nautical experience to try to get themselves out of the jam. But some jams are beyond our skill. I'm sure this never happens to Eric, but there are some computer things that just get my goat. Uh, I wanted to add a widget on my blog last night, uh, a tracking widget, so I could see who was coming to my blog and from where and that sort of thing. And it gave me directions. You go to this page. Now do this. Now do this. Now copy and paste this. And then it gave some computerese ease gobbledygook. Paste it where? Oh, it's easy, right here in the blah, 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 which I intended to take to Eric and Robin today and say, what does that mean? It's just beyond my skill. I couldn't do it. I have no concept of what they're talking about. And the worst thing is, I did it once about three years ago, but I can't do it now. So... They've done everything they could and it's not working. And so they, with a collective sigh, they drop the lines, turn to Jonah and go, okay. <laughs> as 
long as they were fearing their circumstances and Jonah, God had no place for them other than afraid fear. They had no time to think about God, but now they've exhausted everything and the only thing left to do is to turn to God. And it's so sad that that is the normal human response, is to turn to God last when we've exhausted everything else. Because I think, uh, deep down inside, we all believe the non-Scripture Scripture that says God helps those who help themselves. It's not in the Bible, by the way, but we believe it with all of our hearts. Also, we believe that I'm not a person unless I do everything I can. And, you know, there's, there's some good things in that. I, I should work, I should strive, I should try my best. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in fact, I think we often are pushing God away. No, I can do this as I fall on my face. But the scripture says over and over again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Lord is saying. Once they listen to the preaching of Jonah, throw me overboard, I'm servant of the Most High God, who made the sea and the dry land, once they listen to that, instead of saying, no, no, I can't receive that, then they discovered a righteous fear of the one true God. Now when you hear a word from God, you're either going to receive it or you're going to reject it. If you give a word from God, you're going to get people who either receive it or reject it. That's just the way it is. That's the, the normal human response. 99% of the time is to say no. Even if you're a good person. No, I don't need that. I, I already know all the answers. I can do it myself. Now in Scripture, the fear of the Lord simply means the knowledge of God. Let me give you a couple of references. In Psalm 19, 7 through 9, it says, Did I get that wrong? It's Psalm 119. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now remember, Psalm 119 is all about the Word of God. It is Psalm 19? Excuse me. Thank you. So, notice the list of, of synonyms they're putting together. The law of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commands of the Lord, and then it says... The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And it goes back to the ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. So in that list of law, statutes, precepts, commands, uh, ordinances, you also have the word fear. And in our thinking, that doesn't fit. Those are all synonyms for a law or a word or an order. Law, a fear, how does that fit in there? The problem is us, not the passage. We don't get it. The fear of the Lord is the knowledge of God, the understanding of God's word, the, the command, it fits right in that list. It doesn't stand out to a Hebrew at all. They see it. And so we need to get our head around, the fear of the Lord means being scared. We need to get our head around the fact that it actually means knowing God. Proverbs 129 says, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. It's a, it is a, uh, it's a, it's a parallelism. It's a couplet parallelism. They didn't, they hated knowledge. They didn't fear the Lord. It's saying the same thing in two different ways. So we need to get that. We need to understand what's going on. The sailors are fearing their circumstances, and then they're fearing Jonah, and then they're doing everything they can. And finally, finally, they stop, and they step back, and they trust God. Wait a minute, where does it say that? They threw Jonah overboard. Jonah said to do it. They were afraid to do it, and they did it anyway. 
because the prophet of God told them to do it. Now the world is out there fearing their circumstances. Are we sleeping through our lives? Let's pray. Father, be glorified in the life of this church. Use us to this community. Help us, Lord, to not be ignorant or unconcerned about the lost around us. And Father, give us opportunities to live our faith, to share our faith with those in the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.